If you didn't know it, today's kind of a special day. Um, I didn't make a big deal about it on Facebook or anything, but if you didn't know, uh, this past Thursday was LifePoint Church's ninth birthday. Yeah, so nine years, LifePoint Church has been here in Renton doing ministry and, and loving people and, and loving one another, and, um, and I think that that's a, a great way to kind of uh, think about this whole uh, what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks, that God loves our city. I don't think that we, we, we don't hear that enough. Uh, we, we, we say in church a lot of times, you know, that God loves you, God loves me, God loves us, and that's great. I, I, but God loves our city too. God loves our community. God loves all the people who aren't in this room today that are living around us. Um, God loves his cities through his church and so this is a big part of who we are as a church. And so I wanted to take some time today and, and next week and the week after before we get into the Christmas series um, to, to just talk about uh, how God wants to love our city through our church. Now, you definitely don't want to miss next week. Um, but today's kind of the introduction, but next week we're going to really kind of dig in into what this means um, and, and, and what this looks like for, for us as a church and what we're trying to do in our community. Uh, and today I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what it looks like for us in this room, all right, together. Uh, if you haven't taken a Life Point 101 class or if you have only been here uh, in the past few months or year, um, you may not know uh, all of our core values or our mission statement or why we exist and our vision statement for our, for our community. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, during this series, um, these core values that we have as a church. Now, now, every church um, wants to make disciples of Jesus. That's the ultimate mission, right? Jesus gave us the commission. Go into all the world and preach the good news, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and so that's the ultimate mission, but every church is unique. Every church has a unique way that they go about doing that. And so what I want to do during this series is kind of talk about our uniqueness as a church and what we're trying to do and how we're trying to go about fulfilling that great commission. So today I want to, I want to talk about our first two core values as a congregation, and that is authenticity and relationship. Authenticity and relationship. So these things are, are, are a couple of things that are at the heart of who we are as a church and the heart of what we do and the heart of how we relate to one another and the heart of what we, uh, when we start to think about what we want to do in our community, in our city, these, these are two things that are right at the heart of that is that we, we want to be authentic and we want to be in relationship with one another. So I want, to, I want to talk just about authenticity real quick. We kind of have this saying around here that maybe you've heard before, no perfect people allowed no perfect people allowed. And um, I, I want to just talk about that for a, for a second. Um, we, we, we have this saying here that there's no need to fake it. There's no need to fake it here because you're already accepted. And if you were here in the summer, we went through the book of 1 John. And I just want to, I want to kind of emphasize a, a passage out of that book uh, again for you this morning. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and turn there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, 1 John is towards the back of your Bible. All right, so that, if that helps. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, John's writing this letter to these Christians in Asia Minor because they're, they're starting to just lose it. They're starting to go astray, and, and, and John's writing this letter to them to remind them of what it's all about. And so he says to them in verse number 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we say no perfect people allowed, and this is why. This is why. Um, this is why we take authenticity so seriously as a congregation, because when we cease to be authentic, and when we try to just say that, well, we have no sin in us at all, then we cease to be a church and we turn into a social club, all right? When we cease to really be authentic about who we are uh, apart from Christ and who we are in Christ. Um, and, and a lot of good people today have given up on church because of a lack of this, because of a lack of authenticity that they see in so many churches. 
And, uh, and I know many Christians, Christ followers, who just say, you know what, I give up on church because I just feel like everybody there puts on a face and they try to act like they're better than they are and I don't want anything to do with those kind of people. I heard one guy say that uh, he, fi- he found more honesty in one Alcoholics Anonymous meeting than he found in a whole year of going to church. And that breaks my heart. And, and, and as a pastor, that breaks my heart because I don't want our church to be like that. You know, I don't, I don't want us to be a, a bunch of plastic people. You know what I'm saying? Some of you, um, some of you have been in, in, in those kind of, uh, those kind of uh, situations where you're around a bunch of Christians and it just feels like everybody's putting on a front. You know, and it feels like they're just trying to be better than they really are. And for us as a church, we have to, we have to fight against that in ourselves. We have to fight against this, this wanting to act like we're better than we really are. We have to be authentic. And so I want to give you a couple of reasons why authenticity is non-negotiable for us as a congregation. All right, the first reason it's non-negotiable is because we all struggle. We all struggle. John said in verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So some of these people that John was writing to were claiming to be without sin. They were claiming to be better than they really were. Now, um, you notice something about this verse. Who's John writing to? Is he writing to Christians or non-Christians? He's writing to Christians, right? So these are people who've already come to Jesus. They, they already know Christ, but they're trying to put on a front. They're trying to put on a face that they have no sin within them. And here's the dirty little secret about church life. Um, Many Christians do the same thing today. We try to act like we're better than we really are. And what we do is we, we fall into the same trap that these Christians fell into that John was writing to. I mean, now we may admit that we struggled years and years and years ago when we were like four, you know, or five. But now, no, we're, we're, we're perfect plastic people. We don't struggle with sin anymore. And what John is saying is that if, if, if that's how you live your life as a follower of Jesus, the truth isn't even in you. You don't even know God. You don't even know the gospel. You don't even know the Bible if you go around trying to act like you're better than you really are. John says when we live like this as believers, the truth of God cannot live within us. So that's why authenticity is a non-negotiable for us as a church. We have to be authentic uh, people, authentic believers. And this is why we can accept everyone no matter where they're coming from. This is why we can accept everyone no matter where they're coming from in life. This is why I can accept you right where you are. This is why you can accept me right where I am because we got to realize, hey, you know what? We all struggle. We all struggle. No matter how spiritually mature you become, there's going to be days when you just don't get it, all right? And we got to be honest about that, that none of us are perfect. And there's another reason why authenticity is a non-negotiable for us, and that's that God knows our past. God knows our past. Verse 10, John says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So here's this other group of people that he's writing to, Christians who are saying that they've never sinned, that they don't even have a past, that there's nothing that they've ever done wrong. And so, and so John is saying here that if we try to deny the sinfulness of who we used to be, apart from Jesus, then, then we're not just lying to ourselves, we're, lying, we're calling God a liar. We're calling God a liar. And, uh, you know, if you read through the Bible, the whole scope of Scripture, the Bible's full of statements about human beings being sinful, about us being born apart from God. And when we put on this image of perfection, and when we put on this image of, you know, oh, I've always been a Christian, or I don't have a past to be ashamed of, or I don't have, you know, when we try to put on those kind of, those kind of fronts, it, it just, we're calling God a liar. We're denying the power of of the gospel. So this is why authenticity is one of those things that we hold in such high esteem around here because we realize that God already knows our past. God knows every degrading detail of your past, but he loves you anyway. All right, so this is why I can love you anyway and this is why you can love me anyway because we realize that everybody's got a past. And the third reason that authenticity is so important to us as a congregation is because Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Look at verse 12 of uh, chapter 2 with me again. Um, Or I'm sorry, verses 1 and 2. He says, My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So John wants us to know that there's forgiveness for our sins, and it's only through Jesus Christ. 
And so ultimately, that's why authenticity is a non-negotiable for, for us as a church, because we got to realize that Jesus is always enough for anyone. Jesus has always been enough for me. Jesus has always been enough for you. And anybody else that comes in our doors, Jesus is enough for them. And so we can just accept people right where they are. We don't have to ask them to fake it. We don't have to ask them to clean up their act before they come to our church. They come and we accept them right where they are because of Jesus. So we say, no perfect people allowed. We say there's no need to fake it here because you're already accepted. And the reason that you're already accepted is because of Jesus. So, I, you know, I've, I've, heard, um, I've heard a couple of different ways of describing churches. And when we talk about the local church and, and local church ministry, I've heard churches described like marbles or grapes. And um, some of you were wondering what this was, <laughs> didn't you? It's not for communion. We're not, uh, we're not having uh, grapes for communion. Uh, you, have to, you have to mash it up, you know, and drink it on your own. Um, I've heard churches called uh, described like marbles or uh, or grapes, and, and and marbles is like you know every marble is is individual, and you can try to mix them together as much as you want, but they never mix, right? They never, you know, you you can put these in a blender and they'll just break your blender. Right? They're not going to mix together. Every marble is an individual, it's unique, and they don't really, they don't really mesh together. And the thing is, um, churches like this, when a little bit of pressure uh, comes, like if a pastor leaves or if there's a financial hardship or if, if, if there's an infighting in the church, a little bit of pressure comes and nothing really happens. They all stay individual and a few of the marbles leave. A few of the marble, we lose our marbles, right? <laughs> we lose our marbles. So, but but none of them, no, no change really takes place because they're just a collection of individuals. Now, the opposite of that that I've heard is a church like a, like a bowl of grapes. And the thing about these is that you know if you put pressure on these, they all just sort of mush together. But something even better comes out. <clears throat> it's pretty good. So you put pressure on these, and what you get is something that's better than just the sum of its parts. You get something that's beautiful. You get something that's delicious. I got some towels here because I'm going to need them. You get something that's good. And I've heard that churches like this, you know, you, you, you apply a little bit of pressure, and maybe they get broken. Maybe they get a little hurt in the process. But all of the juices just kind of, you know, they, they mix together and they're one. There's something there that's even better than what was there before. The marble mentality grows out of individualism, that we're all individuals and we, we don't mix with one another. We don't really build relationships with one another. And that is completely foreign to the New Testament. That is completely foreign to the way the Bible describes God's church. The first thing that God ever said wasn't good in all of creation was what? That man was alone. You remember that? The first thing God ever said was not good. God created everything. And he created man and he created animals. He created the sky and the waters. And he looked around and he said, all of it is good. It is good. It is good. But then he looked at man alone. And he said, this is not good. It's not good for man to be alone. And then you get into the New Testament and, and, and you just realize that we were never meant to be alone. We were formed for family. We were formed for a family, but this is a new kind of family. This isn't just a family defined by bloodline. This is a family defined by Christ, that we've been adopted as brothers and sisters into the same family. The Bible says that before Jesus, we were alienated, not just from God, but from each other. But now, because of Jesus, we are one. We're something better than we were before. All right, And when pressure comes and when hard times come, we don't just scatter we become even greater uh, than we were before. We become something that was better than we were before. We can't just function separately and individually because we're members of one another. So that's why our second core value as a church, number one is authenticity. Number two is relationship. Relationship. No one stands alone here. We want to be a place where no one stands alone we want to be a place where we're deeply committed to one another and we invest in one another's lives. 
Now, why do we hold that so highly as a core value in how we do church and how we pursue the Great Commission? Why is that a core value? Well, let me talk about this for just a little bit because I I think that we have to get some context. First off, this is a core value for us because in the Seattle area, we're we're, we're not that great at relationships. Like, we're just not as a a metro area, as a region. Um, So one of the reasons that we have trouble maintaining relationships is because our culture doesn't promote close friendships. Our culture and our society and modern life don't promote close friendships. Uh, People who are transplanted to this city often experience what's called the Seattle freeze. Have you heard that? Have you heard of that term before? I've heard it um, in a couple of different newspapers and people have talked about it. The Seattle freeze, it's it's this notion that, okay, you're here. Nice. Talk to you later, right? (laughs) I've got my own stuff going. I've got my own thing. I'm trying to make my own way in business or in my job or with my family or my church. I've got my own stuff going on. We're a busy people. We don't have a lot of time. We always have urgent things to attend to. And so we crowd out the most important things, one of which is relationship with other people. Like in the winter, seriously, some of you go into your homes and you never come out. You're like mole people. Okay, you go into your houses all winter and you never talk to your neighbors, right? I'm as guilty of this as anybody. So we don't promote close friendships. We don't promote close relationships. Another reason why this is such a countercultural thing for us is because we're a fast food type of people. We're not used to waiting for anything, right? We've got our smartphones in our pockets and our iPads, and we're ready. You know, we can just Google it. We want everything now. We want everything fast, and we don't have the patience a lot of times to really build deep, meaningful relationships with one another. So that's another reason. Another reason is because developing relationships is risky. It is risky. It's risky to open up to people. It's risky to let other people into your life. This, you know, this is risky, right? It's risky to be broken in front of other people and to let them see your brokenness. And so we don't want to do that. Uh, Another reason is because we've been burned in the past. How many of you have ever been burned by someone that you cared about? Nobody, a few of you? Yeah, I mean, come on, we all have. We've all been burned in the past and so we're gun shy. Like many of you know what it's like to be burned by someone you called friend. Right, so to just be burned by someone that you that you trusted, and so and then it's devastating, right? That's a devastating thing to go through, and so a lot of us, because we've been burned in the past, we don't allow ourselves to experience relationship in the present, and we just hold people at arm's length, and we never let them in. And yet, we're saying as a church that we want to be a place that loves our city, and it begins in this room. It begins with us as a spiritual family. We're saying that we're going to be deeply committed to one another's lives. We're going to invest in one another, and we're going to be a place where no one stands alone. And so my challenge for you today is to think about in this room, or I know we've got several people who are sick today. There's something going around. I know that that's, you know, in this church, people that you know, who is your 3 a.m. friend here? Who's that person that at 3 a.m. when you get that phone call that somebody you love just died? Who are you calling? Who are you calling? It's not Ghostbuster, Sam. Shut up. (laughs) Thanks for ruining the moment. (laughs) Who are you calling at 3 a.m.? Who are you calling when your life is kind of crumbling around you? Who is it in this church? See, if you don't have somebody like that, then I would, I would challenge you that you haven't been investing in other people's lives or you've been holding them at arm's length, not letting them in. If you don't know who that is in this room or in this church, then something's off. Something's off. We want to be a place where you have those kind of relationships. And I'm not saying that it's going to be with everybody. You're not going to call up every single person, right, in the church. But is there one person or two people? This is why it's so important to be in a life group, right? Because we develop those kind of relationships and we know that there's somebody that we can call when life is hard. We know that there's somebody who will pray for us and will be there for us and will visit us when things don't make sense. The New Testament portrays the church as Christ's body, and we all, as parts of this body, belong to each other, and we need each other. I'm going to read a passage in uh, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, 
If you want to flip over there, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 19, uh, Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. And this is just packed with good stuff to the Jewish people that uh, the writer is writing to. These Jewish Christians. And, and the author of Hebrews says, Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, again, Jesus is enough. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I just want to point out a couple of things from this passage really quickly. Um, we need each other. We need each other because we weren't meant to go it alone. We need each other because we weren't meant to go it alone. This, this whole passage is just a reminder that getting involved with the spiritual progress of other believers is for everybody. It's not just for the pastors or the leaders or anything. It's for all of us together to be involved in one another's lives. So, you know, as believers, uh, our faith is both private and it's public. There's a public aspect. A lot of us just want it to be a private thing that we never talk about and we just see each other at church but we never really open up about what's going on in our lives or how we're doing in our walk with Christ and we never confess our sins to each other and we never uh, pray for each other and we never um, you know, are in each other's homes and talking about what we're learning together. And uh, the New Testament says that that's not what it means to be a church. Anybody can do that. Anybody can just get together for a service it's like Jason was leading us in prayer today. What does it mean the rest of the week for us to be a body of believers together? What does it mean for us to be Life Point Church together? The Bible tells us that what we believe on the inside should come out on the outside. So if we say that we love one another, we ought to show it by our actions. Verse 25, if you, if you look at it again, says that um, we shouldn't neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. All right, so this part of the verse is kind of a foundational reminder for everything. The writer is, is, is thinking about some of these Christians who he's writing to, and whether it's because of their circumstances or whether it's hard times or whether it's persecution or whether it's just laziness, whatever, they had made it a habit to not come to church. Now, that's crazy, right? Christians not coming to church. That's, they don't, nobody sees that anymore. Uh, I'm being tongue-in-cheek a little bit, right? But even in the New Testament, People were neglecting the habit of coming together. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of joking about that whole church thing, but, but like there's something serious underneath this, isn't there? If you study Hebrews, you might think that, that these people he's writing to had a low, a low opinion of Christ, a low opinion of, of faith, because they didn't think it was important to meet together. They, they maybe saw Jesus as something that they could add to their, their, their current religious system. Or they saw um, Christianity as something they could just kind of patronize as they saw fit. Whatever their reasons or whoever they were, the writer of Hebrews says, don't do that. Don't go down that road. Don't neglect the habit of meeting together. And, I'm, and I want to be clear on this. This isn't some like legalistic point of, you know, if you don't come to church, you're a bad Christian. That's not it at all. That's not what we're saying. We could easily go there, though, couldn't we? We could read that into the Bible, but that's not what it's about. The location of your body on Sunday morning doesn't determine your spirituality. <laughs> All right, some of you aren't paying attention right now. Are you being a good Christian? Okay, you're here, but your mind's not, right? Are you being a good so, so this isn't just about what you're doing on Sunday morning. What this is about is, um, is, is are you involved in the lives of the people around you? Because it's in the community of authentic believers that you are going to grow, that you are going to be challenged to grow in your faith, that you're going to be spurred on to good works like we just read. You're going to be encouraged to grow in your walk with Jesus. And if you don't have that, if you don't have that, then you don't have a church family. And if you don't have that, 
you're like a sitting duck for the enemy. You know, I, um, the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? Um, I think it was Peter who said that, that Satan is like a roaring lion. And I used to think that, that, that the Bible was just trying to paint Satan is like this scary guy, right? When I was a kid, I used to think that was just this, this word picture of, of, oh, you know, the devil's scary, be scared of the devil. But I've, I've really come to change what I, I believed about that before because I, I, I've come to just realize something about that whole image of Satan being like a roaring lion. Do any of you ever, have you ever watched like lions on the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet or anything like that and seen how they hunt? Have you seen how lions go out on the hunt? Like, I, it's amazing when you watch it. First of all, it's kind of funny because the men stay back and are lazy, or the, the boy lions, the male lions, they stay back and let the women go out, right? The, the girl lions are the ones who go out on the hunt. So I don't know if there's a principle there, um, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but, but, but what they do is, is that they, 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 they go out over, say, a, a pack of wildebeest, right? And they, 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 they kind of crouch through the grass, and then they, they spring forward. And you, you, you know what I'm talking about. All the herd of wildebeest just go running, and they're all just tightly packed in, and they're running together. Have you ever noticed how the lions will get their meal, though? You ever notice what happens? They'll try to pick one off. As long as the herd stays together and they're running together, that the lions are scared to get in there because they'll get trampled to death. But if they can get one away from the pack, and usually it's a young one, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a younger wildebeest or it's a, it's a sick wildebeest, an injured one, they can usually get that one away from the rest of the herd, and then it's over. It's game over. The lions just go after that one sick one or that one young one. And I think there's an incredible lesson there when Peter talks about the devil being like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Listen, if we're all together and we're investing in each other's lives and we're loving each other and we're doing church the way church ought to be done, then the devil can't touch us. But if he gets one of you away from the pack, away from the rest of the herd, Maybe a young one. Maybe you've just recently come to Christ and you're finding your way through this faith thing. But, you know, you get to a point where, you know, like you've been coming every week. But then you get to a point where you're like, oh, I don't have to come necessarily every week. I just kind of whatever. You know, and, and you start to miss a little bit. And you don't, you don't engage with the community that much. You don't engage with other believers that much. You start to wander off. Or maybe it's a, uh, somebody who's, who's uh, spiritually sick. You know, you haven't really been keeping up with your own personal walk with God. You've, you've kind of turned into one of these plastic Christians who just come and sing a few words, but it doesn't really mean anything to you anymore. If you're spiritually sick, guess what? You're going to wander away from the herd, and the devil's going to pick you off. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, if you stay distant from the body, and you don't really engage in relationship with the body, either physically or by your attitude, you won't be available for God to use you to encourage other believers, and they won't be available to encourage you, and you're going to be easy pickings for the enemy. Body life, community, corporate worship, loving each other, encouraging one another, just engaging with one another on a spiritual level, these are all key components of God's work in your life. You can't go it alone. Don't try to go it alone. And the opposite of going it alone the opposite of forsaking the gathering together is authentic relationship with one another. That's why we hold these two things in such high esteem. The Bible says weep with those who weep. So when somebody's hurting in our congregation, we're going to hurt with them. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice. When something good happens, we're going to rejoice with them. We're going to be happy with them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. This means that we, we move in the direction of other believers. We move in the direction of each other. All right, We don't hold each other at arm's length. We don't do the whole Seattle freeze thing. Right? We don't put on a plastic fake Christianity. We move in the direction of one another intentionally. And we love each other. We build relationships together. Now the other thing that, that we that this passage teaches me is that we need each other because there's work to be done. We need each other because there's work to be done. Paul says to spur each other on. Some translations actually say provoke. Provoke each other to good deeds. Now that, that sounds kind of negative, right? The word provoke. We think of provoking someone to anger or provoking someone to exasperation. And there is kind of a negative connotation with that word. And that's why Paul uses it. He's saying, hey, provoke each other 
to good deeds. Be, be, be spurring one another on. And I think maybe what he was doing is he's saying, you know what, you guys have provoked each other to bad deeds long enough. Now provoke each other to godliness. Instead of giving in to this tendency to, to forsake community, our task is to encourage one another intentionally, intentionally provoke each other to good deeds. And then he says encourage each other. Encourage each other. And that word is really neat because, um, you know, we just got out of this series in the Holy, about the Holy Spirit, how he's our encourager, how he's our comforter. This word that Paul uses about, um, or that the writer of Hebrews uses when he says encourage one another, it's the same word for Holy Spirit. It's the same word. So as we really invest in each other's lives, and as we really encourage one another, and as we really spur one another to good deeds, we are actually joining the Holy Spirit in his work in the world. That's exciting. We're not just on our own. We are actually joining God in what he is already doing in the hearts and minds of the people around us. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come alongside of us to help. And that's the role that God has for us when we come alongside each other and encourage each other in our faith. You join the Holy Spirit in his work in the world. So, you know, in the church, you'll find people in all different walks of life, all different walks of faith. How can you encourage them? How can you encourage the young believer, the new believer? How can you encourage the person who's been a believer for a long time, but they just got some bad news? How can you encourage the person that, that maybe you don't know that well, that you haven't built that close relationship with? How can you encourage them in their walk with Christ? See, encouragers are something that we all need. And encouragers are people that come alongside of us and remind us of God's truth and help us when we need it. So I just want you to know today, and we're going to talk about this really more in depth next week, but God loves our city. God loves our community and God loves our church and God wants to, to love our communities through you and me. God wants it to start right here by our love for each other. You know, the people in this room are your spiritual family. It's not just a, it's not just a loose collection, right, of individuals. It's a spiritual family together, spiritual mothers and fathers, spiritual brothers and sisters, spiritual sons and daughters. And remember, Jesus said, by this one thing, all people will know that you're my disciples. What's that one thing? By your love for each other your love for each other. It starts in this room. So that's why we take so seriously the call to authentic relationship because we can't go through life faking it and we can't go through life alone. And so it starts right here. And so today how we're going to celebrate this is we're going to take communion together. And communion is like the ultimate uh, symbol of us saying together that we are one that all the ground at the foot of the cross is level, that we all have a past, that we all need Jesus, and that Jesus is enough for all of us. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to come and we're going to take the communion cup and the bread together, and we're going to go back to our seats. And I'm going to ask you to, to hang out at your seats for just a second because I've got a special instruction for you before we take it together. So would you stand with me?